Have we finally reached peak Trump? What the biggest story in the world is doing to journalism. The Investigators starts now. Donald Trump. 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 Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. 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 It's not an American story. It's a global story. And the entire planet is paying attention. I think when somebody tells you that they're tired of hearing about a certain news story, it's because of the way we keep presenting it to them. People are looking for the next step of the story. Whether it's U.S. politics or something else, more asylum seekers are crossing into Canada illegally these days. RCMP agents, they're going to deal with someone differently if they're, say, uh, on their own carrying a backpack, maybe a lone male crossing the border. That person is going to be dealt with differently than maybe a family carrying an infant. I'm Diana Swain. We are The Investigators. This is what we do. It's next to impossible to go a day right now without hearing about Donald Trump. Now, he is, after all, President of the United States, and his decisions can impact the lives of people all around the world. Consider the recent influx of refugees to Canada. But where's the line between covering the news and too much Trump? I do get good ratings, you have to admit that. There's nothing fake about that. Donald Trump has been box office for the news business. The president's weighing in on this matter. The president is weighing, at this moment. weighing in right now. Putting Trump in a headline guarantees an audience. It may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. That's all I got to say. And the more the ratings soared, the more Trump people got. He, he, in every situation, seems to be provoking an overreaction. Many journalists would argue it's not about the ratings. Reporting on the actions and musings of one of the most powerful people in the world is a journalist's job. But is the fixation on Trump crowding out other important stories? And that is a real shame because this week has seen a great deal of fascinating stories go undercovered. Canadians inundated by all things Trump have been writing to news organizations asking for more coverage of other stories. But can the news media afford to turn away from a story so many people are clearly interested in? Steve Laterante is managing editor of Digital News for CBC here in Toronto. Charles Adler is a nationally syndicated radio host based in Vancouver. All right, Steve, let's start with you. I mean, here's the dilemma, right? People are watching, they're, they're clicking on news about Trump, engaged, it seems like they haven't been in years, and yet simultaneously saying they're, they're kind of trumped out. So how should news outlets in Canada in particular respond? I think when somebody tells you that they're tired of hearing about a certain news story, it's because of the way we keep presenting it to them. And, you know, we're still in the early days of Trump and, you know, you get the day by day, blow by blow, but we're getting to the point now, and we're not that long into the administration, we're only a month in here, where I think people are looking for the next step of the story. They want to be told what they can do about things that worry them, and they want to know how they can make things better if they if they disagree with Trump or how they can make their own their own political world better. So I think we need to do a better job just of telling those stories as well. And you know, when people say they're sick of Trump, what they're saying is they're sick of not being able to do anything about the news stories they're seeing. That's what's tiring them out. Charles, what feedback are you getting from your listeners? Do they want more Trump, less Trump, or, or do they want different Trump, as Steve suggested? Mm -hmm. Well, all they talk about is Trump, but of course it's no different than the states. Uh, half the people don't like the fact that he's being criticized all the time, especially my conservative friends don't like the fact that I'm not playing along. I'm, I'm, I'm criticizing because I'm just trying to call it the way I see it. That's what I've always done. That's the girl I brought to the dance, but they don't like that. They still listen, of course. Uh, and then, of course, you've got uh, the other side. Uh, they, they can't get enough of, of Trump, and uh, they want Trump called out every five minutes, every time he makes a mistake, every time he lies, every time he says anything. He's the new O.J. There, there was a time when I was doing TV in the States where I tried to get away from talking about O.J., but every time I did, um, the, you know, the ratings went, went south. So the producers insisted that we do what, what works, and that's what the eyeballs wanted, regardless of what they told the pollsters. They were still hooked on O.J., and Trump is today's O.J. And so, Steve, how long are we in this O.J. phase? I mean, <laughs> Trump is going to be president for four years. Can we actually continue to have this level of coverage? It's been a month, and there are people exhausted. Right. He may very well be for four years. Uh, but I think there's still, you know, very much an idea of everybody's waiting to see how these early days are folding out. So the incremental stories that are happening now that are getting huge coverage, you know, I would expect those to fall back as we go a little bit further. And I expect news organizations, especially the ones that aren't, you know, the Washington Post or CNN, who are, whose business it is to cover the daily, mo you know, movements of the White House, will start to pull back a little bit and start to offer more context, more bigger picture news. Right now, 
now uh, everybody's still sort of chasing the shiny object, and it's a super shiny object that it's easy to follow. But uh, you know, as you start to look at your own audiences and what they're looking for, I think those stories will start to fall back and start to change into something a little more, a little more constructive, a little more big picture, and a little more regionally uh, oriented, rather than just what did Donald Trump tweet this morning. You know, Charles, I mean, are we undercovering other important stories or, you know, the other play on this is Trump is such an influential <laughs> figure and can have a tremendous impact on what's happening in Canada that he deserves this level of coverage. Well, you know, it doesn't matter what story is going on in the world. Uh, Trump is either commenting on it or Trump <laughs> is affecting it. But the point is, it isn't just, you know, Canadians paying attention to this American story. It's not an American story. It's a global story. And the entire planet is paying attention. What, what are your, vis, your listeners looking for when they call in? Or do they want, as Steve was saying, a way of having some impact on what's happening? Or do they just want to hear what is going on? It depends on what part of the country. If we're talking about Alberta, for instance, uh, they are loving Trump. And I don't mean it in any kind of romantic sense or hero worship sense. They feel that Donald Trump on the energy file is one of the few people who's a politician who's speaking for them. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't believe it in climate change. Uh, he believes that's some sort of Chinese uh, conspiracy. He wants uh, as m much fossil fuels to be brought out of the ground as possible. So Alberta sees Donald Trump as a friend of the economy, and Lord knows they need friends. And Steve, I'm wondering, how do we manage this idea that if there is a story that is critical of Donald Trump, then people see that as a, a positional story as opposed to a journalist observing something. Yeah, that's something you hear a lot about, you know, criticism of mainstream media and, you know, a capital M media when we're talking about uh, how people perceive the coverage we're doing. And, you know, the media has done a really bad job over the last 30, 40 years of actually listening to its audience. And it's easier now than ever for that audience to actually speak back to the media or to find alternative media they feel is speaking to them more directly. So when they see stories that are critical of Trump and they're, they're true believers and feel they're unfair, they're very quick to call it out as fake news. They're very quick to go find those stories elsewhere. But they're also very quick to challenge news organizations organizations now as well. So the onus is, is really on uh, journalists to show their work and explain why they're reporting the stories they're reporting. In a way, it hasn't really been before. It's the nitty gritty bits of why that story is important really has to be brought out now in a way I don't think we've ever seen before. You know, Charles, I'm going to ask you a question that, frankly, I've been asked a lot, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the answer, which is where is the space for investigative journalism as it relates to Donald Trump, when you do have such a polarized audience in many cases where they think, look, if you uncover something about him, it's because you're trying to work against him as opposed to doing the journalism. Well, from, from your lips, Diana, to the journalist God's ears, because God knows, I've never seen a situation where so many people who are relatively rational most of the time get completely irrational when it comes to Trump. Four out of five people who vote Republican and most people in this country who call themselves conservatives aren't just willing to cut him slack. They believe almost everything he says because they compare it to the media. They say the media are lying, as Trump is saying, and they're echoing Trump. And then, of course, you've got the Democratic voters on the other side who believe almost nothing that Donald Trump says and says, of course, they need the media uh, to call him out. But you've got this, you know, the, this word that we've used so often in the past, but it's getting worse than ever, polarization. And it's, it's, it's really difficult sometimes to talk to people that you know well, who, as I say, ordinarily are very rational, but they become hyper irrational when, when Mr. T comes into the picture. Mr. T, that's the moniker I'm taking with me from this conversation. Thanks, you both, for uh, joining us. Thank you. Anytime. About a spike in the number of refugees entering Canada from the U.S. The Trump presidency is having another impact on Canada. People taking risks to cross the border, hoping to claim refugee status here. Just ahead, a CBC News reporter describes what she witnessed at the border. So it turns out that not all of the samples that you've had in front of you are 100% chicken. Plus, what's really in your chicken sandwich? One of five things we learned from investigative journalism this week. But first, the Oscars. Roberto! One of the biggest TV events of the year. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> Glitz, glamour, and of course, a lot of politics. Climate change is real. It is happening right now. 
where we have fictitious ele election results that elects a fictitious president. Like other award shows this year, the most talked about person won't even be in the room. When the powerful use their position to bully others, we all lose. It's why some of Trump's supporters say they won't even tune in, though the new president likely will. And the president-elect has lashed back in just the last few minutes on Twitter. Meryl Streep, one of the most overrated actresses in Hollywood. He can tweet all he wants. There's only one thing that can stop these speeches. Finally, I want to thank all the artists who worked in this film for over a year. I just want to, oh, here we go. Okay, uh, the studio, I love you. And... I have a funny feeling the orchestra is about to become Trump's new best friend. Big week. Here are five things we learned this week from investigative journalists. Sports memorabilia collectors are accusing the London Knights hockey team of fraud. They told the Toronto Star the hockey jersey certified by the OHL team as game-worn memorabilia had actually never been used by players. CBC's Marketplace tested chicken sandwiches sold by fast food restaurants and found that some contain more filler ingredients like sugar and sodium than actual chicken. An investigation by CNN found officials who oversee U.S. nursing homes are doing little to stop the sexual assault of vulnerable seniors by people paid to care for them. The documents obtained by CBC's The Fifth Estate show how information shared by the RCMP and CSIS led to the wrongful arrest and torture of three Canadian men in Syria and Egypt. And the CBC's Evan Dyer met migrants from Africa and Asia who are worried about President Donald Trump's immigration policies and are crossing Central America in the hopes of reaching Canada. Nowhere has the impact of President Trump been felt more in Canada than at the border. A frightening scene is playing out night after night along windswept and largely unmonitored stretches of the border. You're in Canada. Mm. Is that what you wanted? Uh, from Somalia. Many of the people making the trip, badly equipped for the winter, escaped violence in the Middle East and Africa to get to the U.S. And now, fearing what awaits them there, are pushing north into Canada. CBC News cameras filmed this moment near Emerson, Manitoba, where the sudden rise in illegal crossings has been widely reported. But in fact, Quebec has seen the biggest increase in people crossing illegally to seek refuge. Uh, for January 2017, we have 452 refugee claimants only here. That's three times more than in January of last year, sparking tense debate about how Canada should respond. Consider the abrupt end to this radio interview earlier this week with a Conservative MP who suggests the RCMP should be doing more. It's simple. Apply the law. Well, how would that, how would they apply the law? So would they... Would they stop them? Would they say, I'm sorry, you can't cross here and you should go back across the border? How would... So what's happening in Quebec, which is quickly becoming ground zero for this crisis? CBC News reporter Jayla Bernstein has been to the border with the RCMP and seen that firsthand. So Jayla, you've been there. Paint a picture for us of what you saw. Right. So it's, I think the thing that's most remarkable is when you get to the border there between Quebec and the United States, you know, you might be expecting fences or some sort of kind of harsh border. But really, the thing that is striking is, is really how relaxed it is. And RCMP agents tell us, of course, that the whole border is monitored through um, obvious cameras or sometimes covert cameras. But that's what really strikes you when you come up this dirt road in the country about 15 minutes from the Lacole uh, official port of entry. That's on Roxham Road where we were uh, visiting earlier this week doing a tour with the RCMP and that is where a, a lot of uh, asylum seekers have been crossing illegally into Quebec. And so you're there as a member of the Canadian news media. You're not the only one. Tell us what that was like. As, as these people are coming across expecting no one, hoping I guess to get across without anyone seeing them and then suddenly there's the news media there to greet them. 
uh, yeah, we were all there, very much present, and actually one person did come across, and uh, of course everyone was very quick to turn on their cameras and, and capture that moment of the RCMP um, guiding someone into one of their vehicles, arresting them, and then taking them off for uh, processing. Uh, one, of, one of the really interesting uh, moments, I think, on that day was actually we, we spent some time speaking with an RCMP agent, asking them questions about how things are going, and then after that was done, we actually walked over to this snowy ditch that just kind of divides the two countries. And on the other side, there were two uh, U.S. Border Patrol agents who were there ready to meet us. And of course, they can't cross over, but they came as close as they possibly could to that invisible line. And we on the Canadian side were all reaching our microphones over to um, get as close as possible to them to ask them questions. And then on the American side, American media were reaching their microphones open uh, over to try and capture the uh, Canadian RCMP agents. And the two, the two agents from either side shook their hands for the cameras just over the border. It does sound a bit surreal to be watching that moment. But, you know, it's interesting. We've seen a couple of times now in the coverage, both in Quebec and in Manitoba, that you see someone who's crossed the border get into an RCMP vehicle and they're driven away. We haven't really covered terrifically well, I think, what happens next. So what happens next? Right. So, so the first thing is that RCMP agents were careful to tell us that, you know, they don't treat all these situations the same. So they're going to deal with someone differently if they're, say, uh, on their own carrying a backpack, maybe a lone male crossing the border. That person is going to be dealt with differently than maybe a family carrying an infant. Now, they do have to follow procedure. They have to be cautious. They have to do a risk assessment. Um, and these people are all arrested. But that doesn't necessarily mean the handcuffs are coming out. Um, what usually happens is that they're all guided into an an RCMP vehicle, they're interviewed, uh, their identity is taken and verified, and then eventually the RCMP, in most circumstances, then uh, transfers them over to the Canadian border uh, officials who then go through their processing. So they'll interview these people, they'll question them, uh, they'll go through fingerprinting, they'll document them, and then uh, if everything is clear, uh, most of these uh, asylum seekers uh, will be uh, released on a promise to appear at a refugee hearing at a future date. So these people might go stay with friends and family. Maybe they'll go to a shelter in, say, Quebec City or Montreal, but they will have to go to this hearing after the fact. But there are situations where people who've crossed illegally will be detained. So, for example, if they're considered to be maybe a threat to Canada or if there's concern that they um, could be at risk of not showing up at their hearing or also uh, if they can't be identified, if they don't have the proper documentation on them, then they will be detained. Jayla, thank you. Thank you. They shouldn't be allowed to use sources unless they use somebody's name. The Trump Show, why we can't look away and what that means for journalism. My POV just ahead. Plus, your chance to ask me anything about investigative journalism. What can the media do to defend themselves against a seemingly relentless message by President Trump? My answer, next. First, investigators on assignment. I'm Ed O oh in Toronto. My colleague Keitra Kahana and I have recently returned from Akvia, a remote Inuit hamlet in Nunavut with a population of just over 2,000. Akvia has one of Nunavut's largest youth populations, and many are still recovering from the effects of colonialism and the trauma of residential schools. The new generation of youth find themselves caught between the traditional and the modern way of life. But a unique style of dance has organically formed in the late night gatherings of the community center. We'll show you how dance has given many youth a voice to express their frustrations and honor their traditions. That story coming soon on CBC. What we want to do with this program is discuss journalism, but also hear what you'd like to know. And so we invite you to ask me anything about investigative journalism. And this week, Jeff has a question for me. So what would you like to know? I was wondering, what can the media do to defend themselves against a seemingly relentless message by President Trump about a fake and untrustworthy media? Um, you know, it's interesting because I think it's, it's become more than President Trump lobbing that sort of fake news phrase at people. And I know I've been thinking about it. I'm sure many journalists have. The origin of the fake news, as far as I know, in terms of that phrase, was during the last 
um, presidential election campaign when there were people who were intentionally disseminating fake news. Now it seems to be slapped on everything that people don't like as fake. So, you know, I have to hope that the numbers of people who actually believe there are fake news stories coming from real journalists is smaller than it might sound. And I'm hoping that over time people will get tired of the phrase, that it will kind of lose its impact, to be frank. But we're going to have to wait that out. And in the meantime, I think journalists have to kind of keep their heads down and, and keep doing what they're tasked with doing, which is telling real stories and giving people information they can use to make meaningful decisions. So in that way, our task is the same as it's always been. But I, I think it would be disingenuous for any journalist to say they're not kind of mindful, too, of this whole fake news tide right now and just hoping it kind of spins itself out. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. And here's how you can ask me anything. Email us, investigators at cbc.ca, or just reach out on Twitter at Swain Diana. Tomorrow they will say, Donald Trump rants and raves at the press. I'm not ranting and raving. Whether like Rush Limbaugh, you thought he was amazing, or like Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan, you thought he was incoherent. When President Donald Trump gave that unforgettable news conference recently, I couldn't stop watching. And frankly, I had other things to do. Russia is a ruse. I have nothing to do with Russia. Trump has become the real-life version of Candy Crush. You can't stop staring at the screen. You don't want to admit the hours of your life you've wasted doing it, and will deny it if asked. But are we actually tired of hearing about Trump, or are we just wrestling with the fact that we can't stop watching or clicking or talking to each other about him and wishing we weren't so fascinated? I won. I won. And the other thing, chaos. There's zero chaos. Trump, after all, isn't an on-screen game or a celebrity having a meltdown. He is president of the United States. What he says and does matters. Look only to what's happening at the Canada-U.S. border right now to see evidence of that. For the news media, there's no real business plan in showing people what they don't really have an interest in. And the best business plan is being able to anticipate what they will want. And right now, trying to figure out how long this appetite for all things Trump will last may be the real investigative question of the moment. I'm Diana Swain. We are The Investigators.